So I'd like to introduce the next school. So Portland Village Charter School submitted a written request for charter renewal on January 2nd, 2020 in accordance with the charter school renewal process as outlined in statute ORS 338.065. Portland Village School is a K-8 charter school operated in North Portland. PVS, as we refer to it, PVS currently enrolls 404 students with an enrollment capacity of 444 students. And at this time, I'm going to let Tara O'Neill, our charter director, share more specific school information. Good evening. Uh, the board committee has again been provided already with copies of the Portland Village School Renewal Application, the 2018-19 Oregon Report Card, and the 18-19 Annual Performance Framework and Report. In addition, uh, a, a summary and analysis of the results of PVS's academic plan of improvement. The plan of improvement was implemented in 2018-19 due to two consecutive years of failing academic results in elementary grades, uh, English language arts, and all grades math. While PVS still has some work to do to meet the district average state assessment results in math, the progress toward improvement in one year is apparent by a 15% increase in students meeting benchmark in grades three through five math, and a 13% increase for students in grades six through eight math. Additionally, in English language arts, grades three through five students meeting benchmark increased by 12% and also met the district's average for the first time in over four years. Portland Village School has continued implementation of its academic plan of improvement in this 2019 and 20 school year as well. Portland, Portland Village School has undergone significant turnover in school leadership as well as in the business office in the last two years. There were concerns listed in the 2018-19 municipal audit in regards to internal controls and preparedness for the audit, which were a direct result of having lost the business office staff just prior to the audit. In response, the school has implemented a sound financial management system that includes an internal bookkeeper and an external accountant to provide a more robust system of controls and protection against future staff turnover. Historically, the school has exhibited financial sustainability with a consistently healthy cash balance. Portland Village School consistently meets organizational standards as well on its annual performance frameworks and has a very strong governance structure through its board of directors. Portland Village School opened in 2007, is in its 13th year of operation. It completed its first charter renewal in 2010 and its second charter renewal in 2013. This is PBS's third charter renewal per statute. This renewal of a charter shall be for a minimum of five years but may not exceed 10 years. Portland Village School has requested a full 10-year renewal of its charter so it can be eligible for specific facilities financing opportunities at lowered interest rates. And at this time, I'll introduce the Portland Village School team. Hi, welcome. We've planned for approximately 10 minutes for you to do your presentation, and then we'll do 10 minutes of testimony of folks that you have here uh, in support. We'll ask if there's any opposition testimony, and if there is, they get 10 minutes as well, uh, three minutes per person, and then a 30-minute time period of questions from the board. Okay, cool. Lovely. Thank you. So I'm Dr. Jennifer Stackhouse. I um, go by Dr. J at the school, um, and uh, I am the executive director of the Portland Village School. Prior to coming to PVS, I was um, a principal and a response to intervention MTSS multi-tiered systems of support coordinator K-8 in Gresham Barlow, and then a teacher in the Beaverton School District. So let's see. We're going to start with a board statement from our board chair. There you go. Um, thanks so much for having us tonight. We're really pleased to be able to be here and requesting our full 10-year charter renewal. Um, as a board, we've done um, some deep work over the past few years um, following, the, um, following our administration turnover. We had a short-term principal, and then last year we hired a short-term principal um, fall of 2019. Um, 
she and then found Dr. J as an interim in spring 2020. Um, the board took a lot of responsibility for really doing a deep, thorough search to find um, an executive director that would fit and lead us into the future that we're looking for for our school. We were looking for um, an administrative director um, really grounded in um, a deep sense of um, equity work in education, um, an understanding of trauma-informed schools and tiered supports in schools, um, and somebody that could, that could hold the community and moving forward to this. Um, as a board, we've done a lot of, a lot of um, supporting of really looking at our racial equity work mm -hmm. in the school because we are a predominantly white school and so we've been looking at why is that and how can we better include our diverse neighborhood and our diverse city. Um, so we had a, a great diverse hiring committee that worked on looking for who we ultimately found Dr. J. Um, and we're really proud of the time that we took to do that. We didn't rush through. We were able to um, hold interim positions until we found the right fit um, and are really pleased with what we found. Um, Dr. J came on full time permanently in July 2020. In, in July 2019. Um, the other things that we're really pleased of as a board is that we're um, we're really funding that racial equity work. We've had ongoing uh, racial equity training, and I, we've heard some powerful stories from Kairos about the importance of that work. Um, we're obviously not a culturally specific school, but we're looking at really doing that. Um, in f as a board, we're funding that. We're look using that by how we're what we're funding. So we're funding ongoing equity training um, for the parent community, for the staff. Um, as well as, and then staff, I'll let Jenny talk more about the operations level. Yeah. Um, we've also funded um, full-time counselor position and other supports and are excited about um, the direction that that's going and, and bringing more restorative justice work to the school. Okay. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll just tell you a little bit about PVS. We are a f approximately 400 student K-8 school. We have about 22% students of color. That is a misprint there. It should be 15% free and reduced lunch, not five. 15% and that's direct certification. We actually have more students that qualify, but those are, we have 15% of our student population that accesses SNAP, TANF, or, or Section 8 housing. So that's where that 15 comes from. We're at about 23% um, if you, if you include the other students that qualify for a federal lunch program. And we have a fairly high, uh, significant percentage of students that are um, qualify with an, an IEP. And so that's 19% of our students um, qualify for, for specially designed instructional supports. And then we have not included in that 19% an additional fairly robust population of students that qualify for 504 supports as well. Our mission is to advance an art-integrated education that teaches respect and reverence by developing the head, heart, and hands of children from all backgrounds and cultures. And that is really connected to the Waldorf philosophy and roots. Um, we are a Waldorf, a, a public charter, Waldorf public charter, and we are part of the National Alliance for uh, Public Waldorf uh, Schools Education. Um, we are proud of that. It is, it is a, a certification that takes quite a lot of work and time to accomplish, and um, we are one of maybe a hundred nationally that qualify for that full partnership. So there, there are ways that we go about this, and, and I think, you know, as I've done more work and really learned more about charters, because this is my first experience in charter school, 16 years in education, public, public schools all the way, and, and I have fallen in love with the innovation that charter schools allows us to have. And with that, we get to um, really develop strong systems that are supportive for students. With the Waldorf model, it's a very relational model. It is really about those relationships. That's key and critical to the work that we do. It's relationships with students. It's relationships with the community of families. It really is, it is a, it is a very different feeling when you walk in the door of us together in partnership. Um, with that, 
innovation, we are able to loop with our students. So our students, um, first through fourth grade, stay with the teacher, with their cohort, a class, and they go through four years together. And then they uh, do the same thing at fifth and sixth, and the same thing at seventh and eighth. And what that allows is for students to really build relationships with their teacher. Those teachers know their kids inside and out. They know that they are loved. They, the students know each other and know how to support one another. And so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very different experience of education, and it's one that, um, that is really supportive to, to the socio social, social emotional growth of students and, um, and then as well to their academic success. So we have a relational model. As a Waldorf school, we really focus on a developmental lens looking at children in terms of um, you know, that, that there are processes that students have to go through in order to be successful. And so we, you know, we, we don't just look at them as widgets and, and expect every widget to be fitting in that box in that one moment in time, but really looking at where are they developmentally, how are we supporting them as a whole child, as a whole person, not just academically, but how are they playing with one another? Are they, are they able to um, relate to one another physically? What kinds of supports do they need to be successful? So we really look at the whole child. Um, but there's a lot of lip service given to that in education, and I can absolutely say that in this school, that is for real what we do. We talk about every aspect of that child when we're working with them. We, with that, um, the, the importance of looking at, at every, every aspect of that child, whether we're talking about you know, instructionally common core state standards and, and all of those pieces that we, have to, that, that, we, that we hold to in terms of our responsibility as educating. But we also really have looked um, as a school, and I know that the board has been very supportive of this, in terms of finding and hiring a full-time counselor because we recognize the importance of counseling in the lives of students. Um, and, and so we are fortunate to have brought on uh, Mr. O, Sean O'Leary, and he's gonna speak a little bit about the counseling program that we have. Hi, that's me. Um, I'm Sean O'Leary, I'm the counselor at Portland Village School. Um, it has been um, my goal to be the social and emotional support uh, within the school community. So um, bringing individual counseling to students in need, group counseling um, in the elementary school and the middle school as well. Um, also providing uh, crisis intervention to uh, those students who are experiencing any trauma in their lives. Um, I, I do a lot of programming for students in need of nutritional uh, health and safety support, um, parent outreach. Um, I recently spearheaded um, some um, clubs and groups at our school that I think are um, really beneficial to the community as a whole, including a Queer Straight Alliance and um, peer leadership um, group. Um, and then uh, I think just as a whole, just making sure that the school is safe and um, supportive of all our students. Um, we really try to hold each student um, as an individual in our hearts. Um, and then not really a, an official part of my job, but I support the teachers as well. And as we know, it's Teacher Appreciation Week. So um, a lot of parents here who have um, also helped support teachers and um, we're, a, we're a strong community and really have each other's back. So um, that's, that's a little bit about my role. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so as we've been talking a lot about SIA funding and, and, and the money that's coming through and how people are using this, and so I'm filling out these documents about how we plan on spending that money. And, and I can happily say, you know, because a Waldorf model really values the whole person, and part of that is a recognition that there is a need um, among human beings to express themselves, whether that is expression through, through hand work, through art, drawing, painting, um, movement and dance, you know, music and singing and, and flutes. And so while many other schools have gone to cutting those programs and positions, um, the Portland Village School has really 
maintained our commitment to having that be part of our model and program. Um, art is, is embedded into everything that we do. Our instructional model is one that is an integrative model. So the students are learning ELA, reading, writing, math, social studies, cultural studies are a huge part of what we do. Um, and that cultural work is all embedded, all of that instructional work is embedded and enlivened through art. And that's part of, a part of the process that we go through. So it's, it's, a, it's a relational model, it's a, a committed model to the whole child, and it's an arts integrated model. We've talked, I've talked briefly about instruction and then just now. Our instructional model integrates, as I said, um, art and academics to um, solidify that understanding because, because you know, people process in different ways. So having the opportunity to, um, to explore your learning and your understanding um, through writing, reading, math, all connected through these larger thematic pieces of work. So students might be studying helpers of humanity at second grade level, and they're really looking at helpers from around the world, right? Or we're looking at studies of Islam, and our students are learning about um, what life is like um, uh, historically through Persia and comparing that with ancient Greece and doing a lot of um, really in-depth cultural study. Um, with that also comes a strong social justice and equity focused lens, which is one of the, the core um, principles of the Alliance for Waldorf Education. We've also, through that PIP that we have implemented, which I think is, is um, something that, you know, it, it's, it's, it can be easy, you know, as our, our predecessors just mentioned, you don't always get to that work until you have that time to reflect. And I think that um, the, the program improvement plan has been um, kind of a blessing in disguise in that it has given that additional focus and impetus on sitting back and really reflecting what are we doing, what do we value, and what needs to change for students. And, you know, the community has really come together around understanding and recognizing the importance of opting in, participating in state testing, participating, um, you know, our participation levels went up, we're at 98, 99%, that's pretty significant and astounding, so go, go everybody, yay. Um, we're gonna keep it up this year, um, but we have, you know, also instructionally taken time to look at implementing professional learning communities, um, partnering with PPS on some of that training, and we will continue that uh, as we do our, our cadre work going into next year. Um, we are also working on um, student learning teams. We are increasing math professional development for teachers. We have some di differentiated math, walk two models, and we've had a, hired a math specialist. So these are all exciting things that have been happening in the school um, to, the, to the benefit of kids and also you know, to the benefit of staff because it's, it's an opportunity for us to look at um, you know, our instructional practice and what are we, what are we gonna do to make things better? And um, I, I really feel the sense when you walk into the building and the sense when you go to staff meetings is that people are really committed to this work and that it's exciting. It's exciting because we're seeing success and growth. Um, you are well over time. Oh, so, um, it's me, I'm gonna just If talk, you talk. can maybe wrap up in like the next 30 seconds. Sure. Uh, the rest of your presentation, so. I just talked about sure. the PIP, so we've done but that. Can you go back to that slide oh, and then yeah. just talk about whatever you yeah, yeah, think. Yeah. So this is, this is in that um, application that you've seen before. Um, so this is just taken directly from, um, from, the, from the renewal application. It's one of the figures within there. I think it's figure seven. Um, and so it just discusses the grade levels where we met that goal already um, in terms of where we were trying to, what, what the PIP was, our, our PIP math goal and where we met. We did not yet meet in one of our fifth grade classes. One of them did and one of them did not. And um, in our sixth grade, we did not meet our, our PIP goal yet. But um, we've made strong gains. Okay. But those were not the grades um, that you were focused on? We were, fo these are math, we were focused on all grades. Okay. So, so each grade level, third through eighth, was a focus for the PIP, for improvement for math. Um, the middle is the math goal that we had set, 
and the column on the far right says whether we met the goal that was met that was set by the PIP or not. So we met it in four of the grades. We did not meet it in two of the grades. And in one of the classrooms of the grade that we did not meet it in, we did. And the other one, we did not. So over the average of them together led to not meeting. But when you further disaggregate, you can get some different information. Does that make sense? I do briefly, if I may, uh, want to talk just a little bit about our future. Um, we have uh, been looking, as you know, we talked about this before, about increasing our student and staff diversity. and We've been partnered with Resolutions Northwest. Um, we have definitely increased our, our Hispanic um, student population. Our, our students that identify as Hispanic Latino have increased. So we are at 50, 53 students currently that identify in that way. And for the past several years, it has been in the 30s. So that is a community that we think we have a, an opportunity to partner with, um, also because we do Spanish language instruction. K, K8. So it's it's a natural alliance for us, and we are looking to continue to grow that. Um, I talked about financial stability is a big piece. Our big thing that we want is to find our home. Um, we want to find a location for ourselves. We have a nest egg sitting in the bank, waiting for us to uh, purchase, put a down payment on something, and to purchase. And this leads to my ask, which is we are requesting a 10-year renewal of the charter um, because in order for us to qualify for a SNAP bond, which would allow us to access funds at a lower rate, lower interest rate, um, they are asking for a 10-year charter contract so that they can see that that um, that we are, are you know, ostensibly going to be around, assuming that we meet the requirements of the charter. Yeah, stable enough to fund. Yeah. So. Well, I think we'll have you maybe come back during the questions time and speak because we're we're like ten Perfect. minutes over. Um. So, uh, thank you for being here. I know we'll see you back when we get to questions. Sounds good. Um, and now invite, you have 10 minutes to use um, to have your supporters come forward and speak. So invite those folks who are um, going to speak on behalf of uh, Portland Village School to come on down to uh, the, the microphones here and make sure you write your name down. So uh, Ms. Bradshaw has that because it makes her life easier and we she takes such good care of us. We, we like to make her life easier when we can so we can be difficult later. There All right, welcome. Actually, and th there yeah. actually isn't a pen here. Might there be one up there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can keep it down there. All right, welcome and thank you for being here tonight. I, thank you for having Hi. me. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Shay Carrillo, and I um, I love our school. We we orchestrated our move to Portland from San Francisco in tw um, 2007, knowing that the school was going to be opening and knowing that we wanted our child to attend a Waldorf charter. Um, I believe in public school. I also believe in Waldorf. Um, so it's a beautiful marriage. Um, my daughter, daughter is now a senior at Lincoln High School. She is a, pardon my nerves, um, she is a straight A student in the IB program at Lincoln. And I attribute her incredible zest for learning from her education at BBS. She is a critical thinker. She has a deep desire to learn. Um, and I believe it's because um, she got to be a kid for a long time. And she got to be in her imaginative self and learn through play and learn through knitting and storytelling and being in her body and um, I just think it created an experience for her that, I don't know, like it, all the parts synced up. Like I can't speak really deeply to the pedagogy, but when I have seen it in action and what it produces in children, it's magical. And I think my daughter is a testament to that. Um, we also have a sixth grade son who's performing beautifully in high level math. Um, He's a highly compassionate person, and yeah, I, I could say 
I could just profess my love for the, for the curriculum and for what we've been able to create and, and, and to have weathered the schools through some really hard times and to just feel recommitted and reinvigorated by our staff and our community and feeling like we're back on track and what we're all there to, to create together. Hi, my name is Lydia. Um, I have a son in third grade. We've been there, we've been at PBS since kindergarten. I um, discovered PBS by Sunday Parkways, just riding our bikes. <laughs> um, this was before I had my child, and the people that started making an impact in my life once I had my son, I discovered that my yoga instructor, our music teacher, the neighbor that we really like, they all had something in common and they, they, were, the commun they were part of the PBS community, which was uh, very interesting and it just got my attention on like why, you know, all this community and all these people that are making me feel welcome, where is this coming from? And this is all of what's coming from, from Portland Village School. Um, what attracted me to the school was the community, the support that the child, the, the child has. And I can only speak as a mother, as a son, because I don't have a daughter, but to me it was very important for my child to have movement throughout his learning. And our school provides it, our teacher provides it on a daily basis through math, through painting, through knitting. Um, I noticed that it teaches my child how to concentrate and focus on the things that he needs to do. And one of the very important skills that I think our school is teaching our children is through all these skills as painting, crocheting, knitting, um, working with their hands, is their mental health. Our youth are, as you all know, are suffering. Children and young adults are not knowing how to deal with the problems in the world. And our school helps our children by continuing their innocence, helping them become, a, stay a child, stay creative and curious and eager about learning. I mean, my son is excited that they're getting homework and that he gets to do his homework and enjoy it. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm, I don't have to really say, go do your homework, because he's excited for it. He's eager to learn and to do what the teacher's teaching him and practice at home. So to me, this helps me as a parent to create, to, you know, raise this little human that is going to be creating a community in a few years for us and for their future children. And to me, the mental health that all these children in the school, that you see that they're happy playing and doing activities without media involved, without talking about what's going on, what's hip, what's going on in the world. They just get to enjoy life as it is, without any screens or without any influences. It's so important to our hearts as a community. And I have spent a lot of time supporting my teacher last year. I was in the equity committee meeting um, in South Shea. We were, um, you know, I noticed that our diversity has increased. My classroom, I mean, we had students from parents from Venezuela, Argentina, Mexico, Japan, that I know of. I don't know if there's other parents, but. You know, all of us support each other, and I have been volunteer for the open houses, and I see parents, parents from different cultures coming through our school, and they're curious about how we are combining our Wilder with, our, with supporting minority children. And when they see a parent like me, or like Shay, representing our school, and that we feel supported, and that we have been able to teach our children part of our culture or part of um, activities that we have done, our children feel a little more um, 
supported on who they are and where they come from. And I have had that opportunity to provide that in our classroom, and it's amazing and it's very rewarding. And the children are eager to learn about, you know, um, different the difference. Or I made a, I help our classroom with Frida, and they they all got to draw their self portraits. We have mirrors, and I read them a book, and you know, they were so very excited. And just like the teacher at Cairo said, just it takes just one person to influence a child. It's, we all try, we all, even parents and teachers helping each other, you know, one of us will make a difference for a child in the classroom and we will, I might not know, but we work as a family and that's what makes us stay strong. Thank you. I want to say that we have a screen down here in front of us. So when you see us like not making eye contact, it's because the kids are distracted. So whatever's happening behind us, we also can see right there. So as uh, much as we love adults, it, the kids, cool. yeah, they're. I love the girl running with the big hole in her leggings from on her knee. That's classic. They're throwing javelins at each other. <laughs> Extreme. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so my name is Sean Brennan, and I'm a new parent to the PBS community with a kindergartner this year. And choosing a kindergartner for our, or a kindergarten for our oldest child was a really hard process. Um, we felt lucky to live in a city with so many wonderful, viable options that we could look at. Um, we'd applied to many charters and looked at our neighborhood school, and all looked good. But we struggled to choose which one was best for our family, and most importantly, for our child. And as of now, at this point in the year, we still feel Portland Village School is the best fit for us, which is great. Um, one of the major draws was the focus on the emotional intelligence that Portland Village School really stresses. Um, as parents of a child who was adopted from the foster system, we felt that one of the most important pieces of work in his first years at school is becoming emotionally aware and accepting. Um, with the past trauma of abandonment, starting kindergarten was especially difficult. And his teacher was really sensitive to this and worked with us and created a space where he felt safe. And he was allowed to feel those big feelings. And what was more surprising for us was that his classmates allowed this and made space for it as well. Um, another draw was weekly soup and bread making in the kindergarten class. And I was lucky enough to be able to volunteer on soup day one week. And it's an experience I'm always going to cherish. And students were all just sitting around eating and talking and sharing food as a cohesive family unit. Um, it was wonderful. And meals are eaten together as a kindergarten intimately in the classroom or outside. And they aren't overwhelmed by all the other grades and all the other kids. Um, that kindergarten program really holds these smallest students so tenderly and creates that gentle, quiet space for them to just slowly adjust to school as a whole. And as new parents at the school, we were welcomed and invited with open arms to be part of the larger community. And this was aided in part by encouraging no screens on campus. Um, it allowed a lot more eye contact and ability to really connect <laughs> and make relationships. <laughs> and it's clearly a caring, compassionate place that is constantly striving to become better at drawing out all aspects of our children, head, hands, and heart. And I feel supported as a parent, and I feel like I'm working on a team with the same goals of helping my child, whom I hold so dearly, to develop all aspects of his life. I'm happy we found that this place that honors emotional, social, academic, and physical growth and truly believe that supporting and nurturing all aspects of our children, PVS will help create strong, compassionate, and caring citizens that can enact change and help make our world a better place to live. So. Hi, I know we're, we're kind of going over time. Is this, is it, can you hear me if I'm up here? Oh, okay. um, <clears throat> Uh, so I am here to speak on behalf of my family. We have a kind of a non-traditional setup. My, uh, we're a blended family and my partner is a non-binary uh, um, representing individual. And uh, our son is special needs. And the Portland Village School had come recommended to me by a friend who had had their child uh, gone, gone through the process and uh, from, from early elementary through uh, upper school. And she had heard the struggles uh, that we had had. We, uh, writer has a hard time in a lot of mainstream uh, classrooms for a lot of sensory reasons um, and a lot of social and emotional um, uh, navigations as well. 
And um, from the second that we walked into Portland Village School, the sensory environment was incredibly friendly. Um, it, the, you could feel um, him calm. You could feel him present and able to key in and respond uh, to his academic environment in a way that um, we've even tried social and behavioral classrooms and they haven't had as much success as, um, as the school. They, they design it in a way to kind of track with the Waldorf pedagogy and in, a, in the simplest ways where the, the walls of the uh, classrooms are uh, kind of gradually moving from internal to external expression as the child develops. And we found that, being completely new to Waldorf um, education, that our son had um, been very supported in all of his transitions and his struggles. And the special needs team has exploded in the span of one year. You guys talked a lot at the beginning of this presentation about um, um, numbers and PIP and participation, and, and these are all super important, but I would beg you to consider um, that the looping aspect that, that they have developed speaks so strongly um, to, to the kids, to specific kids that are on, that need that developmentally. Um, we've not been able to find that anywhere else. And it's made a, a complete difference in the life of my child. He is able to um, engage uh, with his teacher, and that, that relationship is precious. Uh, and the other parents in the classroom as well, um, <coughs> excuse me, the other students in the classroom um, are able to find fellowship and community. Uh, we're a group of like-minded parents that you've heard limit screen time, and for me, it wasn't philosophical, it was purely sensory. Our, our son has an adverse reaction to technology, and in any classroom, it was, it was a failure. So to find a group of parents um, and administrators that valued uh, hands-on approach, the tactile um, presentation of counting acorns for a math lesson, and uh, the, the tactile sensation of feeling chalk allows him to engage in a way that a lot of uh, classrooms failed to, to do. And um, the looping aspect in particular um, has, has been, has served Ryder in a way that is uh, very beneficial, but I would uh, expand on that in, in creating those neurodiverse environments. These kids are in the same group with, uh, with other kids uh, that are having different social and emotional struggles. And the kids are um, able to create an environment where they can hold space for each other and learn how to navigate uh, someone who's, whose brain works different. And we've been able to find, he's been able to develop and maintain friendships. And that is a wild thing that we did not think was possible for him. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah. We really appreciate that. All right, thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. Bradshaw, do we have anyone who is testifying in opposition of the renewal of the Portland Village School Charter? Not that I know of. Anyone? Okay. Uh, we're now moving in to a time of questions from the board. So whoever you have, Dr. J, that's going to come down and uh, take questions, invite them back to the microphones. So my first question is going to be the one I asked Director Bailey when you let us know that they call you Dr. J, and it's, can you dunk? No. <laughs> Not at all. But I do, I do say you pull off a gnome costume with thank perfection. You. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> my skills are in gnoming. <laughs> And Not creating uh, ignominious, I think. It's is the, true. It's true. And it sounds like your um, skills are also in creating amazing turnaround and in creating this amazing space. Um, the gentleman who testified, I uh, was distracted because Dr. J started to cry and um, during your testimony, and I think that that 
what we're, you know, we are on the school board because we deeply care about children. So to hear those stories of how mm-hmm. children, especially children who, like your son, has suffered some uh, trauma, are supported and find their home and find their place mm-hmm. is just like why we get up in the well, get up in the evening and come to these meetings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you. So stay, yeah. stay up, stay yeah. up all night. Yeah. So I'm gonna hold you to thirty starting okay. now. Do because uh, I feel like we might be here all night otherwise, and I could just talk. Yeah, you. It's amazing when people love what they're doing so much yeah. that they can just speak so eloquently and so passionately, and and we've seen that from you all tonight. Yeah. So we're going to begin with our questions, and I'm going to ask my colleagues if they have a question they'd like to start with. Yeah. Uh, not quite yet, but I, <laughs> I, I basically heard you begging to continue to be on a plan of assistance because of how beneficial it was. <laughs> I, you know, I am always keen to have focus on what we're doing and the truth is the truth is the practices of a plan of assistance are kind of the just strong educational practices anyway so you know if you take us off the plan I'll still make us do the work because it's the right work (laughs) so well I do have a follow-on to that question so you know unfortunately we had the experience last year of Mm -hmm. um seeing Trillium through the closure which was largely because of inability to make that kind of progress on their academic Mm -hmm. benchmarks so Mm -hmm. um you guys made great progress Mm -hmm. it's a really short short time period Mm -hmm. where the expectation you're held to the expectation Mm -hmm. so aside from um creating Mm -hmm. a new culture in your school of Mm -hmm. encouraging testing Mm -hmm. um i want to hear you talk about um what changes you put in place with your instructional practices and what that means for your future and just generally the culture of expectations in your school. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a couple of things that have happened. One um, is the implementation of professional learning communities, which happens to be my dissertation topic. So, um, you know, so uh, really looking at what does teacher collaboration look like? How do administrators support collaboration? Um, how do we how do we make that effective collaboration work? Because that's really where the power comes in terms of um, raising understanding, giving time for teachers and processes for teachers to look at student data, um, and then kind of digging into what does that data actually tell us to do, right? And then, actually doing it so so there are those there you know it's, it's a multi-layered process and it isn't an it isn't a one-year process it's a process that's going to take years um and and but but it but it's the work that that educators do right so we have um, developed uh, professional learning community processes that we're putting into place. Um, you know, we're starting weekly. Yeah, well, bi-weekly for math. We have a bi-weekly uh, PLC process and on the other alternative weekly meeting. So if it's not the hour of math PLC, it's some math instruction, math professional learning that's happening. So we are reiterating math, math each week um, for our staff. Um, and... Um, Along with that, we're also putting in place uh, multi-tiered systems of support. So we're doing tier meetings um, multiple times a year where we're looking at student behavior and academic data and then um, talking about tier one supports. So that's like the the majority of your students are going to be supported through kind of generalized instructional plans. And then you have anywhere from, you know, 15% 15% of your students who might need some a little bit extra, and then maybe 5% of your students that would be looking for more like special education supports, um, ideally. Uh, that, that model gets a little bit tweaked because we are a school of choice, and so we have you know, people f- choosing to participate in our school because it fits their, their student needs. Um, which I think you know, changes kind of those percentages, but uh, that process is still the same. Okay. Oh, great. I would just add to that that um, the board also is um, kind of on a administrative but on a board budgeting level that we freed up money f- to hire specifically math intervention, math support staff. We hadn't had that in the past. Um, mm-hmm. We have our teachers loop. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get too much into operations, but the teachers loop and our generalist teachers. Um, so, but we've added with board funding um, mm-hmm. math specialists mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. um, that are. Yep. And Maureen, I know you had wanted to add something at the time mm-hmm. of your presentation. Do you want to? Do you remember what it was? Oh, it was about finances. 
You want to go? Do you want me to say that now? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, we've been a really financially stable school. We've had a pretty conservative board in terms of budgeting. Mm-hmm. Um, since our inception, we, we've been stowing money away for the point knowing that we, we have a high rent that we pay every month and knowing that someday, and we have limited leases, that we'd like to have a, a permanent new home at some point. So we've been able to stow money away every year despite only getting that 80%, right? Um, so we have a substantial nest egg. In addition, um, this year, this fall, we were able to, we were the only charter school that was able and eligible to put money into the state PERS side account. Mm-hmm. And we, um, and that had a um, 25% match from the state. Mm-hmm. And why were you the only charter school that was? Because there? of our substantial savings. So you had mm-hmm. the yeah, money. You had, okay. there was a minimum amount required to put in and we were able to Mm-hmm. Exceed the minimum amount. There are a couple of schools that were able to, there but yeah. Few Congratulations okay. on that. Emerson also. Okay. Uh, Emerson yeah. as well. Sorry. Yeah. We'll just say that out loud uh, okay. for the record. Emerson, Emerson as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we're, we're pleased with of our budgeting and our ability to do that, to bring down that high rate of PERS mm-hmm. that, um, that Kairos talked about, the high PERS debt. It's still high. It's it's still, higher than other it's people. It's still high, but, but we yes, have this side account to help us. That, that's a yeah. helpful piece, and that's due to your uh, conservative financial approach that mm-hmm. allowed you to have yeah. that resource. Okay. Um, I, you talked about looping, and I noticed that mm-hmm. kindergarten doesn't loop. So the mm-hmm. are the kindergarten teachers mm-hmm. sort of specialists in kinder, yes. and then yes. first through fourth? Because I remember when we went to visit mm-hmm. that kinder had their own sort of side play they area. They do. They, they kind of hold kindergarten in this sort of uh, special place. Special place. <laughs> yeah. So. I was going to say magic fairyland. Man, yeah, a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. There's some gnomes. Gnomes happen. Moss. You know, it's all good. I, I just, when we were there the other day, there were the, lots of things happening in that yes, space. It yes. felt like magic fairyland. Yes. It's, yeah. It's a really beautiful, it's a really beautiful way to look at it. And, and you do, you do, you see these children and they're, and they're doing fractions and they're cutting, they're cutting like, oh, let's cut that carrot in half. And it's like, oh, wow. Okay. But it's, you know, they're learning. It's just, it's a really you know, a holistic kind of approach to learning. Yeah. Yeah. You talk a little bit about your um, outreach. You know, it is, Mm -hmm. we understand how the lottery system works, but um, you have grown your, um, specifically your native Spanish speaking um, population, but can you talk about your outreach? Sure, well, first I'd I'd say, I think you know that we even um, instituted a weighted lottery this year, and we in Kairos were, two of the schools that worked hard with the state to allow for a weighted lottery. It hadn't been allowed until um, two years ago, I believe, is when the state approved it. So we, um, as last year was our first year to uh, have that weighted lottery. We know, however, that the weight is not the only thing. We also need to do the outreach. Um, Remind us of what the weight, uh, they, you covered this when we went to visit, and I know Chair yeah. Constein wasn't able to be there, and I so, don't remember, and I was there. So, so. until two years ago, um, Lotteries had to be blind. You could not wait for gender, for race, for any, for anything. It was, they had to be completely blind. Um, but that that meant that when only middle, if if predominantly middle class families hear about you, your your lottery is full of that. And Kairos had a problem as well, where they were at risk of being gentrified. Right, so we both had an interest in like we want to wait our lottery so that we can have more diversity. And you said I remember from our visit that you said there are seven criteria you can use, and y'all there are seven or eight criteria, and we chose four because we wanted to focus specifically on racial and Mm -hmm. underserved um, populations. Um, The state also allows for disability, for gender difference, um, gender identity difference, and. but what are, uh, what are regional. the four? And what so I, we chose not to focus on those because um, we have fair representation in the, of those groups already. So we wanted to mm-hmm. focus on weighting our lottery to groups that we don't have. And so uh, we have. It is now, uh, we've shifted it this year um, to be more inclusive. So our current lottery going in for the um, includes non binary third gender. We've got, what else do we have here? Oh, sorry, that was the upper part. Um, uh, historically underserved, race, ethnicity, origin, um, uh, e- English language learners, um, free and reduced lunch, language immersion, and Head Start. So we're looking at those. I just pulled it up. Yeah. <laughs> so mm-hmm. It sounds like more than four, the way Jenny said it. I yeah. think it's five, but there's four plus All right, Head Karina start. or Tara. Race, ethnicity, ELL, poverty, and, poverty. and 
Right. Right. And race and ethnicity race, are two different yeah, ones. Race, ethnicity, poverty. And, and language learners. English language right. learners. And then within those subcategories, there are ways that you can identify. Right. So for poverty, you could qualify under free and reduced lunch or Head Start, potentially. Thank you for taking mm -hmm. the time to explain that so we're clear, because okay. I think it, it matters yeah. as we talk about how we go about ensuring that our charter schools reflect the diversity that is the, the general population of PPS students. Right. So that was one level that, on, on a board level, that we worked for that, to have that weighted lottery approved and board approved of that, but more on the mm -hmm. operations level and yeah. outreach. Yeah, so um, on an operational level, um, I've really worked to develop partnerships with um, communities of color and really done um, connection with our, our family members of color as well. Um, developed a relationship with um, um, uh, Caravana del Amor and uh, Guerras Latinas, um, which we do have a parent that is affiliated with them. Um, and so we've been doing outreach um, in the uh, Latinx community in Portland and the, the greater Portland area. Um, and we did a, a, a community service project over the winter holiday break, um, right leading up to that time to support um, homeless, homeless, houseless uh, people in our community and Beaverton and um, you know, out in the Gresham area. Partnership with, with Guerras Latinas. Yeah. S so it was, it was a, it was a interconnected partnership between them and our students at the village school. Um, so we've done that. We've also increased because of hiring, and we know it's so important for students to see themselves um, within within their um, their their teachers and their leaders and their schools. Um, and I think that's part of you know part of something that's important to me. So I'm very open and upfront with my with my students and staff that I am neurodiverse, um, that I have dyslexia, and um, was somebody that qualified for uh, special education myself. Um, so that they can see themselves reflected in me. Um, and we also want our students um, who are racially and ethnically diverse to see themselves reflected in their teaching staff. So in our hiring um, practices, we've been, I have been very um, clear uh, in terms of uh, referencing the importance of equity in the work that we're doing in our school. So it's like the second thing we are looking for, you know, somebody who values equity is right up at the top of what we say, and we talk about um, preferences to uh, bilingual staff members. So, um, And I saw on your slide that you're counting ed 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 experience as well as education, yes. and that that's yes. increased your people of color applying by 50%? Exactly, yeah. So having both of those, so so in our wording, we say experience can uh, can qualify for education, and that has made a difference in who's applied, for sure. And we've hired two staff members of color um, this year, and... You know, yeah, and our applicant pools have been diverse this year. Yes, our applicant pools have been diverse. Um, yeah, and then, sorry, no, I'm going to jump into the operations we're, here, we're but I'll team. just keep we're us team. moving along. <laughs> um, we've also, we also have our promotional materials in Spanish as well as English, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. when we're announcing our um, open houses on, on Facebook and mm -hmm. social media, um, and in the community through posters, um, Bilingual. We're, we're, they're bilingual and they're in targeted neighborhoods and in targeted community mm -hmm. centers. Mm -hmm. And are you seeing, I mean, I know your uh, percentages have increased. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that these efforts are helping that to continue to increase? Yeah. I, I believe so. And, and I think um, we've also been adding pieces too as, as we refine the, the lottery application system. How did you hear about us? You know, those kinds of pieces. Yeah. We want to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's new, so we're still gathering the data on the results, but yeah. it's. Mm -hmm. They are visible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to give you a chance to amplify. There, there's a question here in our, our question, suggested question list <laughs> about your goals over the next mm. decade, yeah. we'll say. Yeah. And um, so clearly you've talked about uh, diversifying mm -hmm. both students and staff, mm -hmm. uh, improving mm -hmm. your outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. Deep, yeah, mm -hmm. finding a home, deepening mm -hmm. your PLC work, for example. Are there other things that you would add to uh, that kind of next big, next big steps for? Uh, yeah, did you? Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll tag team again. Yeah, okay. um, yeah. As a board, looking forward strategically, we'd like also to be um, 
a place where public Waldorf, ed where we can be leaders in the public Waldorf education movement, mm -hmm. where folks are looking to us for how do you do racially, culturally diverse public Waldorf education. Um, we have some really phenomenal teachers that are really doing deep work in that and how to bring in, I mean, Waldorf lends itself to that, I think, the multicultural stories, but we have teachers really deeply doing that work. Um, and we'd like to be seen as, as regional leaders, if not hopefully someday national leaders in how that work is done. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully in 10 years, our student body and our staff, um, physical makeup will also represent that. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's one thing I think as a, as a board, we'd look to that direction of like being an institution that also can provide trainings for others. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Um, that's one thing I'll let you go on with others. Yeah, so, so we've talked about you know, the new home and, and uh, all of those pieces. I, th I think that Mo has really touched on um, wh one of the pieces that is so important is that teacher education piece. And there have been um, some, some holes that have been created on this, on this coast. The East Coast has you know, Antioch and other places that really spend a lot of time um, supporting Waldorf uh, teacher education. But um, you know, we, we have had lo the loss of, of uh, Steiner College and some other places where teachers have gone to get rejuvenated and, and to learn. And so that also creates an opportunity right, for us to, to develop. Um, uh, so uh, we, we want to, to continue to grow in that area. Uh, we have also really talked about um, you know, the importance of, of uh, being able to provide um, educational experiences to preschool students. I think that that is, that is a big piece. Um, you know, we have head starts in our community. We've got students that, that we know would benefit so much from kind of this, this loving Waldorf model to provide um, some preschool learning. So I would love to see us you know, continue to work. We've had those conversations. Um, other pieces that I think are important, just in terms of like, we're getting money, we, we would really dearly love curriculum. <laughs> that is one thing that is really hard. Um, as a school, uh, as a charter school, the funding is so tight. Um, we are excited about the opportunity that the SIA funds provide for us because they will allow us, first of all, to continue um, s s providing a, a school counselor and additional intervention support for students, but also curriculum because charter schools, where are you going to carve out of your budget some, you know, Thirty, forty thousand dollars for a curriculum kit—that's that's expensive, right? So, so having the ability to be able to purchase things because our teachers are often cobbling together pieces that takes a lot of time—time time from them when they could be like planning interventions. Instead, they're having to plan like core instruction, and that is time-consuming. So, um, that's a piece where we we are looking forward to getting um, you know some some material pieces that will help us really do our job effectively. And efficiently. Yeah. Home. We want a home. And then, a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, permanent, a permanent home. That was yeah. my next question about just the status of your mm -hmm. search and efforts. Mm -hmm. You're in an enviable position yeah. that mm -hmm. if, it, if it surfaces, you yeah. can pounce. But right. yeah. yeah, of course, real estate is not getting any easier to find in Portland. Yeah. Yeah. Concordia. Concordia. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when that happened, I did have several people <laughs> send me emails. Yeah. I got one about 12 seconds after the yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, we, yeah. We we have, have a few. We have a couple that yeah. we're looking at. Uh, the big the big challenge for us was is the snap bond and what we qualify for and and essentially in the conversation with the banker they said 10 years. Like that's what you need. You need the 10 years to access the um, the funds. So Yeah, we are we're in conversations about a snap bond which is Kind of the charter schools or nonprofits equivalent of a bond building, building loan, um, mm -hmm. but but right they said oh you only got five year renewals at a time hmm so yeah. so that's I, why we're coming to you asking for yeah 10 so well. I'm I totally my you know I'm like okay yeah they need ten years that makes sense mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. for and I'm understand that from the bond perspective part of me is like oh they're just coming off this improvement yeah. Yeah. so yeah. is it wise for us to say yeah. ten years so mm -hmm. I mean. And, and you've done so beautifully. Yeah, yeah. And so, how, I mean, mm -hmm. that's kind of my, like, right. wrestling. And so, um, 
tell me things that make yeah. this decision easier for me. Yeah. Well, yeah. okay. I, I, will, I can, gonna, I can oh, share yes. something first, oh, okay. yeah. which is that our accountability framework is still mm -hmm. in place. Right. And so, um, you, you don't, when you get a, t if you get a 10 year renewal, you mm -hmm. don't just skate for 10 exactly. years. No. You still have yeah. the same accountability back. framework yeah, and right. it kicks in after mm -hmm. two years of non-compliance financially mm -hmm. or, um, mm -hmm. you know, lack of, uh, appropriate achievement academically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, so it's not it's not a great risk, right? So there part. are systemic pieces yeah. that right. that we use to yeah. keep them accountable. But what I'm more asking for is y'all saying this is why we know oh. yeah. we are not going to go back to that place, and this is why we know you I should invest in us. <laughs> kids to the school so we're going to be successful <laughs> um yeah no I mean I think I think you know from a from a from a logistical point of view we are still as because of the charter's a contract right so we are still uh, uh accountable, accountable to meet the the um the stated goals of that contract were we not to meet them um then you know you would you would do your due diligence in terms of serving the students of of Portland Public School and and the community. Um, we I think all as educators um, have a have a real uh, serious belief in the importance of, um, of you know the work that we're doing to make the world a better place and to educate kids. And I think um, you know it. it for a number of reasons, uh, we ended up in a situation where we weren't necessarily able to do that in the way that we would like. And, um, you know, this was the opportunity for us to really sit back and say, okay, what are we going to do going forward? Um, I don't think that any of the um, the teachers at the, at the school um, are, are, you know, nobody sits up and says, I'm going to fail kids today. Like, th nobody <laughs> does that. So, so we are, we are committed, um, and we have the leadership, we have the, the, um, supervision from a board that is highly committed and highly involved. Um, we have, uh, the supervision from, um, the Portland Public School Board as well that is going to make sure that we are accountable. Um, and, and just quite frankly, uh, you know, I think that we are all, um, understand that urgency and that need um, and I can just I will say for myself um, that is what I do and um, and I am committed to making sure that we are able to uh, meet those goals going forward and um, and that you know we end up in a place where we have systems and not silos and so this we are creating systems that will outlive me you know because someday you know, maybe I'll win the lottery. Who knows? But, you know, like, you want to make sure then that... Then you can buy Concordia. Exactly. I'll buy Concordia. <laughs> well, I'll just go have a school. But, but, but you create these systems that outlive you, right? Yeah. And that's what we're doing here. We're really putting systems and structures into place so that, so that when a teacher leaves or an administrator leaves or a bookkeeper leaves, the, the system keeps going. The model keeps going. Because there's, there's strength in the model. I have one last question. This, um, well, I don't know if it's last. I don't know if my colleagues have questions. This doesn't really have any bearing on your <laughs> renewal process, but I'm curious. So with your relatively low rate of um, vaccination, um, <laughs> tell me how do you deal with that as a school community? And yes. I, I'm not especially well informed. Are you subject to the same exclusion um, yes. policies? That we, mm-hmm. We have increased our vaccination rates, I believe. We have a lot of families that are on alternative vaccine schedules, which I will freely admit my children are also on. Um, and uh, we um, have uh, a situation where uh, we are also um, completely culpable to the, to the exclusion date. Um, yeah. Speaking to my head secretary, we only have five families left um, that we have. So her goal is for us to have no exclusions coming up next week, and we should be good to go with that. Mm -hmm. um, we, when an incident happens or if there's an illness kind of situation, because we don't have a school nurse, you know, mm -hmm. charter schools don't, um, we contact Multnomah ESD and let them know, hey, we've got a, we've got a sickness mm -hmm. going around here. Um, and they, they let us know the communication that we need to have with families. Um, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where, um, you know, we we have uh, choices in in our communities around how we handle our children's health. Um, 
and um, you know we we work within our community to educate about the importance of, of you know health and 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 different strategies and also we um, we make sure that we are meeting our requirements so yeah, we're complying with state standards mm -hmm. we did a lot of education last year around the measles outbreak yeah. we had a lot of really clear communication um, about that and in communication with Multnomah County Health Department yeah. State Health Department, CDC, around what that would look yeah. like and what our immunization rates were like. And uh, yeah, I think frankly, yeah. our immunization rates have really it, what ends up happening over that time too. What ends up happening is we have a lot of families that are that are um, they're fully vaccinated, but they're not fully vaccinated on the schedule. So you know, we yeah. have families that have our rate shows lower. It shows is lower what we're than. Our rate slower. shows lower because slower not lower. Slower not lower. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because you're marked as non-compliant if you've just not done them all by age five. Yeah. Right. But most of our kids are vaccinated by shortly after that. Yeah. 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 That's good to know. Yeah. It just impacts <laughs> our. It yeah. just it makes does our numbers. Our numbers. Good. Our numbers look have looked awful. Yeah. Uh, um, final question. I forgot to ask. Uh, Kairos talked about they've been using the map assessment. Uh, are you using that, or do you have some uh, alternative assessments that you use yeah. for that data mm -hmm. yeah, feedback through the year? We we implemented Foundus and Pinnell, um, which is a which is a reading assessment. At this time, we are looking into we are doing um, common formative assessments that have been teacher driven and teacher created created for math. Um, with the new purchase of a math curriculum, that is a piece that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. Wanting to make sure that we have a state approved math curriculum. Um, our current uh, elementary adoption was approved back in the day, and then it's Singapore. Singapore is no longer state approved, so we need to make a shift with that. Um, so, uh, you know, with with that, I think that there is is a goal for myself around um, increasing uh, the right kind of assessments at the right time, and looking at them in terms of what are they intended to do and what don't they do, right? Because, uh, you know, like the Dibbles assessment, you look at Dibbles, Dibbles is great at what it's intended to do and it is not good at what it is not intended to do, right? So, so if, you're, if you're literate in terms of what the assessment is, is intended for, then that's useful and if you try to use it in, a, in an inopportune way, <laughs> it won't give you what you need. So there's definite work that we want to continue to do around that with math, and we are going to continue, and we have continued this year our Founders and Pinnell assessment. And, mm -hmm. and full disclosure, PPS <laughs> has a lot of work to do with math curriculum. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it's, again, yeah. we're, all, we're all in this together. Yeah, Thank you. yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thank you guys. Thanks so right. much for your time. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Thank you especially to the parents. Thank you to the parents for sharing your very personal stories about your children's experience. It's really helpful to us, and um, it's just really gratifying to hear about how well-served your kids are. And I want to thank our staff that are here, Karina and Tara, for the amazing work they do. I'm new to the board and I'm new to the Charter and Alternative Programs Committee and I'm the chair um, and so have needed a lot of uh, guidance from both of them and they have been excellent and exceptional and then thanks as always to Kara who um, is our board secretary and makes the trains run on time and <laughs> make sure we have all the things we need and um, to, is it Patrick running sound tonight? Who's running? Terry is running sound tonight so we thank Terry thank for you, Terry. running the sound so yeah. All right, and we are officially adjourned. No, nope, hang on. No, oh, you put your hands up. I thought it was stop. So, yeah, Karina has one yeah. thing. <laughs> this is the first time I get to wield the gavel, so I'm super excited about it. Let, yeah, let me, it I'm going to be very fast. <laughs> I just want to make it clear that while the two schools or while this um, Portland Village spoke of having uh, materials in Spanish and outreach efforts in Spanish. I just want to make sure that it's on the record that all of our charter schools have all of their materials, um, their outreach and their brochures in all of the five major languages. So That's just so fantastic. just to make sure that everybody knows that. That's, That's it. Thank, thank you. you very much. And That's I think great. you also were addressing like your Facebook posts and some of your other outreach is also in Spanish. So thank you for that clarification. Okay, we are adjourned.